Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, second session of the mobility training module organized by MedCities. I hope you enjoyed the first session and that you get plenty of ideas of this second session, which will be focused on real examples. Uh, I, would, I would like to remind you that there is simultaneous translation in French and Arabic um, available. If you experience any discomfort with the, with the translation, let us know in the chat and we will try to help. Um, well, for its optimal use, we recommend you to install the latest version of Zoom and also to use headphones. Uh, as well, we kindly suggest you to modify your name and include the name of the, your municipality so that we can know where you're from when you, when you talk. So without nothing else to add, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank also Miguel and Alex uh, and the translators. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed today's session. So whenever you want, Miguel, you can start or Alex. Thanks a lot, Gemma. I'll uh, take over then. Um, thanks everyone for joining again. It's been a pleasure last week um, and we're very much looking forward um, to today's session. Uh, today we'll be starting a lot more interactively. Um, so uh, we will be talking about what we have done last week with the mobility challenges where we collected your challenges, we prioritized them. And today we're going to talk about um, for about 20 to 25 minutes um, about how these challenges influence your cities. So you please also prepare to speak. Uh, you can speak in English, French or Arabic because you're already in the right channel. You will be then simultaneously translated the same way that I am. So you don't worry about the language. You can speak in um, uh, in uh, English, French or Arabic. So today's agenda is first we're going to talk about these uh, challenges. Then we're going to talk about engagement in a little more detail. We, we talked about them uh, last week uh, as part of some of the examples. We're going to go have some more slides on this and particularly also uh, some on citizen engagement. Then we will talk about some financing uh, background. So some ideas on how you can finance um, innovative mobility projects. And then the majority of today's sessions will be on what we call use cases. So implementations of smart urban mobility projects in municipalities in the Mediterranean. As you will see in this uh, today's agenda, one point is missing that we hope to do today, uh, where we would have talked about the um, resilience plan from the city of Izmir. Um, unfortunately, um, that cannot happen today due to uh, um, uh, the unavailability um, uh, from, from Izmir. Uh, we wish them all the best, um, but we will not be able to do that today. Um, apologies for that, um, but nothing um, we can uh, change there. So that's why we directly jump uh, into um, the first um, interactive part. So um, please, um, for yourself already in your mind, think about these challenges and how they um, materialize in your municipality. What are you know the practicalities around them? Because we would like to give 15 of you or so every time about one minute to speak and to um, really introduce what you are doing, what the problems are in your municipality. Because as you know, after these training sessions, there are also the direct um, support sessions that we are providing. And it makes sense for you and for us to talk about these things um, already today. So this is, um, as you might remember, the outcome from last week. We have done a little bit of structuring so that you um, see which ones are high priority, medium priority, and rather in a lower priority sector. So we have four um, topics in high priority. Um, first one being improving public transport service provision. So the way we provide transportation services to the users, to the citizens. The second one, to avoid negative health and safety and environmental impacts of urban mobility. The third one, 
encouraging soft mobility in very hilly and high slope environments. And the fourth one, um, um, sh shifting um, the mode of uh, transport into the direction of soft transport, so a transition challenging from going um, from going to uh, towards soft modes of transport. So um, that is the ones that were named as high priority uh, last uh, time. Um, so I would maybe ask the first five of you um, to already comment on this. How does this look in your city? Which ones um, are particularly important for you and how do they look like really? So just comment on how this really influences your work or your city. Um, and for that, in order for us to be able to, um, to bring you or to give you the right to speak as well, please just raise your hand. Um, that should be in the panel that you see. Miguel, maybe you raise your hand once so that people can see how that then looks like on the, um, on the screen. So then we ha you have a, a raised hand on the top right corner um, of your uh, of your screen, and that allows us then to um, uh, to get you uh, to announce you, and then for you also to speak. As always, there is special, um, let's say, um, support, um, mental support for whoever um, dares to speak first. So please um, tell us about how one of these four. Um, uh, challenges, those were sent as highest priority in, uh, in our last session, influences your city. I cannot see any hands yet, still waiting. So please, everyone, this is going to be the, so the first 20, 25 minutes, really about you explaining what, you, uh, what your uh, work looks like, how these activities influence Thank you. Um, and apologies already if I uh, pr pronounce any names wrongly. Gazan, I will uh, hand over to you and I very much hope I pronounced the, the name correctly. Please. It's please. fine. It's Gazan, but it's fine anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be the cobai, as the French say. I will be the, the lab rat. So I will start. Um, last time, I think I mentioned that we had uh, in our town, I am Rassan Tayoun, so I uh, am a member of the municipality of Zgarta Ehden. So it is two names, Zgarta and Ehden. It is a very unique challenge because we have two towns, one in the plains at 100 meter altitude, which is the winter town of Zgarta. And it is the most important in terms of administration uh, because everything is there. Nine months, it's lively. And then we have the Ehden, Ehden, which is the oldest town and up in the mountains at 1400 meters altitude. And there is a 30 kilometer distance between the two, 1300 meter difference in altitude. But the main problem in fact is the drastic change of population with the seasons. So you can imagine that all, almost all, about 95% of the population of Eden in the summer goes down to Zgarta. So Eden is empty in the winter. And Zgarta counts about 36,000 people in uh, winter, uh, 26,000 uh, in summer. Plus in the daytime, you have a, a flocks of uh, cars coming down from the mountain for work reasons and going back up in the afternoon. So uh, with all this, so that I will let you imagine the challenge. I think you are expert enough to, uh, to guess that. Uh, the other uh, problem is that we do not, in Lebanon, we don't have a real national policy or a national public transport service, or at least program. Uh, they always they keep insisting on trying to resolve the problem of traffic coming into Beirut, which is our capital, on a daily basis from Beirut to the outside. And we keep always trying to uh, convince them that we may want to try to resolve the problem in the major clusters of cities in the north, in the east and in the south. And then this way alleviate the pressure on Beirut by providing a nice, fluid, uh, well-organized transport route from these uh, places. 
So uh, they take or not this uh, into account. But then when the policy, when it comes down to getting the finances with the World Bank, through the World Bank, usually everything goes back to Beirut and they have failed so far in, uh, in solving the problem. So anyway, we have uh, made a couple of attempts, not many, but definitely a couple of attempts to find a way to resolve this issue of seasonality and also at the same time of the excessive reliance on personal vehicles, which destroys everything, especially in the summer, because the, 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 uh, the, res the summer resort town of Ehden operates over capacity, especially in the month of August. And we don't have enough places for the cars to circulate, for the cars to be parked, et cetera, et cetera. So for that specific area, we usually create ad hoc, because we don't have the finances to do otherwise, uh, uh, parkings at the entrances to the town and uh, put at the service of people coming in, of commuters, uh, buses to circulate and then take them where they want to go, uh, which reduces the pressure, especially when you have the festival and everybody wants to come in. So it gives us, it, it puts us under a, lot, under a lot of pressure. The other issue in Eden, for example, although it is a beautiful weather, beautiful place with nice uh, scenery, with good food, so everybody wants to go there, but we cannot really implement a soft mobility scheme because it's very, very hilly. It's the mountains. So it's hilly and people who usually can uh, bike uh, are reluctant to do so because of the grades. So this is why I am very, very happy to see that point three is, encourage, uh, is on encouraging soft mobility in very hilly and high slope environment challenge. So um, anyway, each one of these four points are uh, quite important in our case anyway, and especially uh, two and three for the summer town. So if you wish uh, later on, we could maybe uh, share uh, the uh, the ideas, the, the concepts that we try to put in place, which are inclusive of the taxi, of the people who operate taxis between the two towns, because they are very, very aggressive when it comes to accepting buses, which are kind of a, a, a huge uh, competition to them, because their livelihood, in fact, depends on that route. So we, we proposed at some point to uh, renovate the whole private taxi park and uh, like finance that move, that transition, and at the same time link all the taxis into a single plan of providing mobility for everyone. So the taxis for those who can afford and prefer to be served by taxis or what we call here a collective taxi. So it takes five people from the same destination to two to, uh, one or two destinations uh, uh, to take them to one or two uh, destinations and also include them in the uh, train them to be bus oper bus uh, chauffeurs bus operators so that they don't feel left uh, left out and this should uh, resolve the, the issue of negative health and safety and environmental impacts on due to their very, very old cars that they use. Plus, it uh, resolves the issue of social problems when it comes to excluding these people whose livelihood depends on the taxi, of commu on, on the private commuting. So very interesting. Uh, no, so that's that's uh, you. You have a very, very special case. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, for this, I'm um, just you know to give um. Uh, some some comments on this is uh, like what what happens a lot on a very small scale when it comes to uh, you know cities that are one city not like the two places you have is like you you think about in transport planning about the local um, um, uh, traveling so the ones you do in like let's say uh, two kilometer radius which you can then transfer into soft mobility. Uh, walking, cycling, and then there is the part in your um, special case, 36 kilometers, I think you said, um, 
between the ranges that you know you never walk um, or or cycle, especially not if it's hilly. So that's that's a, a very interesting part of you know you have the area connections in both towns, and then you have the point to point connection in between them, which are two different two issues to be tackled partly separately, but then also to be integrated again. So the way we see this a lot in uh, in many places across the world is actually that the point to point connect connection would be either a train or a a large scale bus service or you know a publicly organized kind of thing and then the um the mobility within the areas for the area mobility is rather um then tried to be integrated in a soft way so where people can walk everything but you're you're having a great set of um trials there already i specifically love the way to integrate the private uh sector taxis uh in, into this system it's always you know transition can be painful or it can be done with with the actual stakeholders that are currently providing it. So great initiative there. And we hope to be able to talk about this in more detail throughout the next sessions and hopefully in afterwards too. Thanks a lot, Gassan, um, uh, for, for your first rage. And we wouldn't call you a lap rat. I would rather call you um, <laughs> the, um, the daring first one uh, to go for it. Um, I hope really we have maybe one or two more. Um, for this set of challenges with similarly um, or also um, uh, other kind of examples, you don't ha already have to have solutions. Talk about how it looks in your um, uh, city. What are the specificities? Um, please raise your hand. Uh, would really like to have two more, one to two more for this part. And then we will do it twice more um, for the medium and low priority ones. So do we have more people remember you can speak in english french and arabic you don't have to worry about the translation um, that's what we have our great colleagues from the simultaneous translation service here for so let's see if we find another daring another um, one like kasan to um, show your story about your municipality please <laughs> Doris, are you trying to speak? Mm -hmm. That would be highly appreciated. Doris from Elton. Doris from Elton. Elton from Doris. Elton from Doris. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Elton from Doris, can you? Are you? Yep. Yes. No. Hello, everyone. Hello, very I'd good. I'd like to speak about Duras. Uh, we are a seaside uh, city, an urban area with around 10 or 15 percent of hills, around 200,000 uh, people, habitants. And uh, we have some issues about the mobility in general, but uh, getting around your points to the point number one, the improving public transport service provision. Um, Mostly our areas, our urban areas, has a different density. So our five lines of public transport um, consist in a low demand generally. And uh, we don't have an integrated um, public transport system about our main station. And, uh, around the second point, um, our only national, national low has uh, imposed a ban on the imports of vehicles that are under a Euro 3 engine. Mm, for the rest, we don't have uh, mm, initiatives about uh, uh, lowering the environment, the impacts of, of mobility. Around the number three, the soft mobility, um, we have the main issues with the sidewalks. They are not in a system. They are not in integrated infrastructure with uh, all the details about uh, old persons or wheelchairs. They are not standard and uniform. So I cannot ex accept, uh, expect immediately to have a transition to the um, soft mobility like um, electric uh, 
electric bicycle or something else before uh, having an integrated um, sidewalk infrastructure. And the SWIFT uh, mode of transport, um, the quality of urban areas, at least at the center city, as having an improved. Our new projects are trying to give the priority to the uh, to the walker, to the pedants, uh, for the persons to walk. So we have increased the size of the walking site to try to push a little bit over for the people to leave the car and have a walk instead. I don't know if you understood me or am I clear? I'll get better speaking on in public with the next sections, but uh, this is my first introduction. No, very good. Um, and thanks a lot for, for that. Very clear. Um, I remember um, uh, from a walk in Tirana a few years uh, it's back in general, you know, the information that are available in the sense of planning. So what is already there, what is not in Albania, you know, can improve. And that I think is a good starting point for um, if you if you want to improve any kind of infrastructure, having a status available um, is is an important uh, element that you mentioned. Um, I'm not aware of the, the kind of public transport lines that you have. Is it bus or is it train, um, Elton? Uh, maybe you can just answer that one. Um, uh, super no, only bus. Only, only bus. bus yeah. After, yeah, we yeah. don't have a train station better a functional <laughs> train station uh, no no that's and that is absolutely normal and also the uh, for for many uh, cases the right starting um point and there is always this kind of this swift change then uh, at some point when the network infrastructure gets big enough more people start using it and then you can play the game huh? they do that everywhere in any any uh, city no matter how um how intense the system is you you increase then the public transport system and you lower let's say the qualities or the um affordability of the private transport system in the sense of putting in congestion charge higher uh, prices for for parking um so that more and more people then move from uh private transport to public transport um and as a seaside city you will always have you know the um, not having like the inner city centers where you will have the circular um, uh, traveling around it, you will always have, you know, this main diagonal going through and um, some, uh, you know, streams that just cannot be managed because they end up in, in dead end. So that's gonna, that's a very interesting one, Elton. Thanks a lot for, for sharing. Um, as these were two great examples, I would now move further um, to the next set of um, uh, of challenges that we discussed last week, actually that you brought up um, uh, last week, and I will just um, briefly read them out and then hope again for two to five um, uh, you know people from your side to explain how this influence so very much like Elton and Gazan have done it. Um, for the first ones. So um, um, the first one in the medium priority list is involve citizens in the mobility uh, issues. We're going to talk about that also later today. Then the second one um, are that there are small streets in your municipalities and of course the lack of parking available. Then third one is improving urban logistics with a focus on last mile delivery, last mile distribution. The first, the fourth one is a shift to active modes of transport. The fifth one, providing safe mobility for women, so a specific subgroup of the population. And the sixth one, developing low carbon mobility for the city. Um, Khalif, you have already um, shown, Mr. Khalif, you have already, um, uh, you're already showing yourself. Do you want to speak? Can you? Do you do you maybe want to um, talk about um, how it is in your city? Okay, maybe um, some others um, here in the um, in the group. So maybe just raise your hands um, or um, 
um, or uh, show yourself in the camera. You also don't have to put on the camera to speak, don't worry. And again, you can speak in English, French or Arabic. So I would also be very happy to have one uh, of our French um, speaking colleagues or of our Arabic speaking colleagues here maybe um, sharing something from their um, now municipalities. Yeah, Alex, if you want, what we can do is if, if you want to start with the examples and uh, I we can encourage people to write on the chat and so on so that afterwards they can uh, expose their, their own cases. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Just waiting a few more seconds if someone wants to speak now, Gemma, and then we move forward. Thank you. Perfect. And now disconnecting again. No. Okay, so if no one wants to share at the moment, that's not a problem. We're gonna come back to this, but really um, use this um, these interactive sessions also for you to be speaking. These were two great examples um, already. Thanks a lot um, again. And now we move just to the last um, set of um, challenges that you have mentioned already earlier. Um, the improving the quality of public space. Uh, improving traffic flows, and that includes uh, intelligent transportation or intelligent transport systems abbreviated by ITS. Um, avoiding transition barriers, so making it easier to avoid uh, to go from a status A, status quo, to an intended status B. And then the fourth one, reducing the usage of cars. So these were all the kind of challenges that you put in the matrix in our um, activity last week. And this is also how we're gonna move forward and from next week onwards when it comes to going further. So um, if we don't have any um, people who want to share now about their uh, own municipalities uh, status, there are two topics that we have already touched upon last week, but that we wanna go into a little more detail. And that is engagement. I'm going to start with citizen engagement and then show an exemplary um, full um, engagement process for a project. And then we're going to talk about financing in a little more detail. So um, first uh, on citizen engagement. And I think this is an important slide just to take away for yourself in structuring that in your mind. Because very often when we go into projects and the term citizen engagement come, comes up, everyone starts sitting up straight and say, okay, we have to take citizens along the whole way from idea until implementation. That is not the case. So citizen engagement is a thing done in particular ways at particular stages um, throughout the implementation journey, throughout the planning, from idea planning to implementation. So please keep those three distinct types of a citizen engagement in your mind as one of the main slides you take away from today. So there is um, the one called co-construction, um, where you ask users um, um, about their uh, input uh, in, in several things. So it's a passive engagement method, um, uh, like um, bringing the people in, asking them about, um, um, about their opinions on different things, putting out surveys, um, having uh, methods to add agile, ag agility, uh, agile, agile methods to actually bring them into uh, workshops and these kinds of things, but it's rather the kind of providing, so citizens provide feedback um, um, via um, indirect methods. So that's the co-construction kind of one. Then there is the co-design um, uh, element. And that is really where you bring in the people that and they help you design um, uh, elements. So that is, um, can be participatory. Those are most, most often done in kinds of workshops uh, where there is a little bit of prototyping or you have a map of the city in front and where citizens can, you know, propose some elements, some activities on some parts of the, um, uh, of the streets. Um, you can do that also electronically with digital methods. 
um, where they, you know, can suggest elements and then bring them into um, the processes. And here they really provide active um, uh, elements. So they provide ideas um, and feedback into the um, development of, uh, of the projects. And then there's the third one, which is actual co-production. That's the highest level of engagement where you actually say the citizens cannot just bring in ideas and give feedback. So feedback giving is the first one, providing um, actual ideas is the second. Second, And the third one is really you, that you use them also to implement some of the um, ideas. And that can be done by volunteering. That can be done um, in specific actual implementation projects, applications, uh, apps in that sense, having community gardens, community fora for uh, discussions. These kinds of things can also be not just ideated and not just the idea brought into the development process, but really the citizens can do them together. So that is the most active part of um, uh, citizen engagement, having them actually actively take part in the implementation. There are some super simple examples of this. Um, where, for example, a municipality that we've worked with said, you know, we need, an, we need an, a platform where, cities, where um, citizens can share, um, um, you know, lawnmowers or bikes or um, hangers for, um, for moving things around, all these kinds of activities. And, you know, uh, one of the uh, people in that municipality just said, okay, I'm going to set up a Facebook group. And this Facebook group has now thousands of users. The um, things are shared there. They are posted. There's a very active group. And that is, you know, zero cost. An idea from, the, um, uh, from, the, from one of the citizens, a great lady, by the way. And she just runs this uh, as a volunteer. And that has a great impact um, on resource efficiency of the city in that particular case. So these just as three elements um, um, for citizen engagement. Maybe um, take this in that way. Passive um, uh, support, providing feedback, uh, providing ideas, providing actual solutions. That's the type of way in which you can engage citizens into the projects. And you know, I want to show you one of the processes that we have completely run through. And that is now not only citizen engagement, but a general stakeholder engagement kind of um, process. This slide, the main output of that slide is for you to understand that this is a, a multi-step process. All the points that you basically see here, except the last one is planning. Uh, and you can design that in any way that is suitable for your, uh, for your implementation journey. The important thing really is take out, um, um, design the right elements and bring in the right people at the right time. So the first step that we have done here was actually a massive workshop over four days with 42 people and a mixture of all kinds of uh, people. There were normal citizens uh, involved. There were, um, you know, municipal employees involved, scientists involved, um, some um, uh, companies from the area also involved, and we brought them all together um, in a three and a half day workshop. And we had them, so to say, design the first vision and the first structure and mission of a complete new district. So not just the mobility part, but all the other parts uh, as well. We used a specific method. This is not necessary that you use that specific method, but um, this is a, a method called Syntegration. It's from a Swiss company. Um, you can design that yourself. You can also not do it in one four-day session, but you could split it out. But the important part is there was a set of people, a very wide range of different people that basically created the first um, mission, vision, and the core elements of the project. And they stayed on board then throughout the rest of the process in many, many different ways. But there was this general energy that was created in this very first session. So everyone got to know each other. One had food together, one had drinks together so that we could you know, really get to know each other's viewpoints. And one thing that um, I can tell you from this, when this happened, I was a lot younger. Um, and um, 
one of the most amazing things in this particular workshop was some of the very best ideas that are also now being implemented came from what came from people that were invited as regular citizens. Uh, so these there were lots of transport experts uh, like me, uh, and we had our ideas. But the ones that had the really the, the ideas that had really had the twist of this you know local knowledge and you know using these kinds of systems every day they came most often or two of them in particular two very great ideas came from those people that were just invited as regular citizens and that had then their very own viewpoint but what the benefit of this is really is getting a clash of cultures getting a clash of many different viewpoints creating an energy and going into this with a very you know almost a blank sheet and then going out of this with a direction and an endpoint. So you wouldn't get out of this a pathway on how to get to that endpoint, but you would get a direction and a potential endpoint. And from then on, it's on to professionals or other processes, so to say, to design that way. And then from there on, we had many different um, kinds of steps. And I'm just going to single out a few of them um, because it took about three years from this um, moment until the pilot implementations took place. So this has also been a very thorough and a very long process uh, in that. So for example, we had a, another one, summer school, it's one of my favorites, um, where we basically then, so let's particularly get some more young people, some students ideas in that one. And we organized a summer school, a week-long uh, summer school where students from many different countries and from many different backgrounds basically were put together. We gave them the challenges, the ideas, the general direction that came out of the first step and told them, hey, how would you approach that? What should be the you know, um, kind of um, projects that should be implemented? We divided them up in groups and had each, one of, uh, each group um, define a project in detail and then define a business plan for it and pitch it um, to the um, board of this project. And they did that by the end of the thing and at least one of them will be implemented. Not all of them, also not all of them were meaningful, but some were really cool ideas and inspired some other activities. And one was such a good idea that it actually gets implemented. So um, that was another step in this, um, uh, in this uh, activity, set of activities, another one was defining some more of the underlying um, problems. So uh, in uh, Gazan's case, for example, um, there would be the need to really understand and to have data on how the people move because it's a very particular case. So when are they using the connection road? What are the patterns? Why are they using it? Is it mostly for um, outside the peak hours when it's um, for leisure purposes or is it for work purposes so that you can then understand where to tackle these kinds of problems. So it's an analysis um, a kind of part and that is at any planning element. And that's also what we talked about in the sustainable urban mobility plans last week, have a thorough kind of analysis of the status quo um, of what that is. And that's not only quantitatively, but that's again talking to the right stakeholders. So for example, the public transport providers, in Gazan's case, also to the taxi operators. In Elton's case, it would be talking about talking to the bus drivers, why they think there is no one entering the buses. What's the problem there? Talking also if it's um, a user problem, talking to potential users, why are you not using the kind of story? All these kind of soft and hard facts are super important that you can, at the later stage, when you collect ideas for implementation, thoroughly make, an, um, uh, make decisions on what is meaningful and what is not. And then there comes the stage that's the, always the most fun stage of any of these, it's the ideation. So it's like, you know the problem, you know the end point of your, where you wanna go, and now you really want to figure out how to go there. And there we had many different kinds of sessions. We had evening sessions with food, with, um, with citizens. We had expert sessions with companies and uh, universities. Um, and we basically created a whole set of ideas, prioritized them again, um, uh, created new ideas. We used what is called the double diamond principle. So basically um, you ideate, so you 
you open up the funnel and you say, you know, this is a very law, a very big list of things we could do. Then you narrow it down again, which ones make sense, which ones do not. That's so to say the first time. And, and then you do that a second time. And when you did it the second time, you have a very strong and thorough list of ideas that you can bring forward. So that's basically what you can see in the middle. And one, of course, there was also the elements where you had to discuss this after the first time and with a political class to actually see which ones will great gain political support, but also it allowed us to explain to them, you know, this is your citizens, these are your voters that really want this, this is your taxpayers that will um, bring these, uh, that will also use these kinds of things then. And then uh, after some iterations, we basically came up with a plan that could be in your scale then a sustainable urban mobility plan or a new mobility plan, as we said already last week, there is very little difference in the naming. It's an important part is actually engaging um, stakeholders and citizens at the right points in this process. And then you start. Huh? Um, and starting is often with pilot projects. And for pilot projects, you need then at the latest the private sector. And that is on our part, often a very separate kind of process where you say, okay, first as a municipality with my citizens, with my local stakeholders, with my universities, with my politicians, I want to figure out what I want and where I want to go. I want to have my own ideas before I put them to the private sector so that they can then, um, um, you know, fill the gaps, but also work based on the ideas that are already there. So it's problems that are looking for solutions and that solutions that are looking for um, for customers. That's always the kind of case that we see in many um, um, discussions. A municipality that is prepared, that knows what it wants, um, can discuss on an eye level with private sector. Um, municipalities that are not prepared, don't know what they want. They become more or less, they have to follow the ideas of the private sector. So always for yourself, be prepared to discuss, know what you want. Don't just follow the ideas of others. And this process basically exactly gives you this. Some pictures I have for, for these activities. So this was um, uh, this was the, the group that uh, worked on this. I hope you can see my mouse. So this is a younger me here in the, uh, here in the background. And you wouldn't recognize here who are the professionals and who are the um, normal citizens, which is uh, which is a great thing. Just from this group, so that you know, this person ended up uh, creating the architecture plan um, for that. I ended up uh, creating um, the uh, mobility plan for that uh, district. This person here um, ended up being um, uh, being the stakeholder engagement officer for the project. This lovely lady is the person that is now operating the uh, Facebook group that I was just talking about um, uh, earlier. And there is this um, person whose company um, will, um, let's say, um, build up, uh, I think, 30% um, uh, of, of that area. Oh, now it jumped. And then there is one more who I at the moment don't find who is now the data privacy officer of that region of that uh, district can see him here but he's somewhere on that picture too so just that you see that out of this process is not only great ideas and you know lots of energy that came out but in the end also some of the responsible people in the end driving these kinds of activities you know and what we did you know when you collect ideas you very often have and that's you know so the the start of one of the the first double diamond. So when you collect all the ideas and it's really just about getting people to contribute. And then you have 400, we had in, on a board 400 statements of importance. So these are things that people thought were important for them in this district. And then from there, you can start working. You condense it again, you work it up again, you discuss them and it's very intense. And what we did in the end, we came out with 12 um, particular sub goals, sub visions that we wanted um, um, to be done. Huh? So, for example, the uh, the question that was put up in the mobility: How can mobility for persons, goods, and services be smartly designed regarding dimensions and modes? So that was basically the 
um, the outcome of the en engagement process and this question was then set to the um, professional that was supposed to answer it and create a plan out of it, which in that case was me in uh, the one for, for data. I didn't find the person there, um, uh, but um, uh, here uh, it was what has to be done to ensure the acquisition is, and usage of data supports, that data supports the implementation and operation of that district. Uh, and this person was then also um, be put uh, together. So that's just um, that you see also how this was the intermediate outcome. And now this project is in the stage of really implementing. Um, as a, so to say, general kind of introduction based on these three elements. So some were informed, some actually gave ideas, some actually um, um, provided, um, uh, not just provided their own ideas, but really implemented them. So that would have been my input on the citizen engagement and engagement part um, that we already touched upon in some elements last week. And if there are any questions now, please raise them. I'm um, monitoring the, um, the chat. I don't have anything in there yet as questions. So my next point is actually moving um, towards the financing of uh, city and urban mobility projects. I'm just waiting 10 seconds to have a sip of coffee and also if someone has a question. Okay, then we uh, move on. Um, and I think uh, one of the most important concepts to understand as a municipal employee um, uh, working in, um, public, uh, in the public sector is um, the financial returns, uh, um, which investors um, also, if you work with the World Bank, uh, if you work with, um, uh, with public funds, the kind of financial returns that you can generate with a smart urban mobility project is only a sub part of the actual benefits um, that, um, the, that your projects provide. A much bigger set of, or in addition to the financial benefits, your projects very often provide socioeconomic returns. So an improved accessibility, um, better health of the, um, of the um, uh, people, um, reduced travel time. So a lot of these things can be monetized. So in the end, they can be transferred into something that you can say is worth a euro or more. But um, very often it's, uh, it's just another set of additional um, benefits. And then there is the more diffused, much more complicated benefits that, you know, if they are, um, um, you know, one of these things that we say here, for example, data availability. Uh, lots of public transport agencies provide data availability um, in the, uh, with their operations. Um, and these um, kind of, uh, activities, these data do not provide a direct financial return, and they often also do not provide a direct socioeconomic or, um, or other return, but they provide more transparency into, into the operation. They provide um, more informed citizens, and potentially schools use these kind of data for training purposes and these kinds of things. So there's a whole set of diffused benefits that will often be in the discussions when you talk about implementing a project, but they are super hard to be monetized. So this is why um, um, as a concept, it's just important to understand some partnership, some parties will look only at the financial return. So if you work with a bank, if you work with a financial investor, what they will be focusing on is the financial returns of the project. Then there are those, um, that will be looking into the socioeconomic uh, returns, politi politics, um, arm length companies of, um, of public agency, also a public um, uh, providers of public funds. So if you, if you aim for World Bank uh, or European Investment Bank or Horizon funds or similar, there will be an element of what's the socioeconomic benefit of what you are doing. And then there is the wider, more diffused benefits which you see might happen, which are super important, which provide um, in the end a long-term benefit to your city, but which are hard to grasp 
and hard to communicate. But in general, what your projects will have is all three of such element. Important thing is that you understand that they are there and that you communicate them. So um, that is, um, so to say, the general underlying principle of these things. And then when we come to actually, how do we invest in these things? We have different elements. So the first um, kind of money that's available to you is always your own municipal budget. And no matter how good public funds from somewhere else might be or whoever else provides you money, it's always highly beneficial to have it. Not um, because you know um, it's, uh, it's crucial for the actual amount in there because if you put in money, you also get then a say in how things shape at the end. And they all, it also shows to your partners, might it be public funds, might it be private partners, commitment from your side. So lots of public funds that you will find will in the end ask for co-investment, depending on what kind of uh, thing uh, you implement. So that's the first one. Then you can have it co-financed through external public funds. I named some examples already. World Bank is one. Uh, Horizon uh, Europe is one. For those of you that are part of the union, you have the um, structural funds, the ERDF funds, which are massively important for uh, putting up um, uh, infrastructure in, uh, in any country in uh, Europe. And then, oh, that's got a little delay. So, um, the next level then is uh, public and private partnerships. And that can look, we could spend three days only talking about public and private partnerships. Um, basically, what you take away from this one slide from my side is everything is possible that's legal. So if you can imagine it, there's most often a way to do it. I've seen a lots of employees say, we have never done this before. So they're, they're the kind of, um, you know, we are afraid of touching these kinds of things. Um, don't. Uh, the, there is a lots and a lots of value in these kind of activities. So I do one example, um, but it might not help because it's just one random one. So a whole district that I, I know about, including the mobility ecosystem, was financed 50-50 by the municipality and by a private developer that provided everything that was needed to get this project off the ground and has now a development plan for the next 30 years. They are working hand in hand. They own a special purpose vehicle, so a specific company that was set up only to develop this area 50-50. They also created under this company another company that was specifically only there to operate the mobility system in that district. So these kinds of activities, they can look in many different ways. You will, um, you will see um, you can read books, and as I said, we can speak days only talking about public-private partnerships, but basically in this way, everything is possible. And then you shouldn't forget that as mobility, um, um, as professionals in the mobility sector, there are things that we don't have to do. There are private companies that do this. We have talked last week about you know, um, free-floating car sharing mechanisms that are not uh, really, so we don't pay for them, uh, we don't operate them, that's done by private sector. The same with electric scooters. So it can be done that way. What you may want to do then, or it can be financed by them, what you most often want to do them as a municipality is influence them. Work with them, um, influence them in the sense of how they operate. And for that, you need the legal basis or you need a share in the end in the activity, which brings you back to the kind of public-private partnership activity. Um, oh, now it's jumping. Um, uh, a little bit. So when you're financing um, uh, urban mobility uh, project, what you need to know and what you need to look into as a decision maker in, in a city is the different sources of capital. There are many different ones um, available. Loans, grants from many different kinds of institution. You want to look at the number of parties that are involved. Is it simple? Then you can, uh, um, then you can use um, bigger um, uh, funds easier. Then you want to look into how easy it is to secure that kind of financing. So there are public funds where there is a success rate of 60%, and then there are public funds where there is a success rate of 3%. So you might want to have a look into this as well. Um, then you want to look into the duration of financing. So especially for the long-term ones, infrastructure-based one, you'll find a lots of 
different types of financing. For the short term, small ones that need barely any infrastructure but are rather software based, it's harder to find um, uh, financing. You want to have a look at the risk for the investor. So what's the risk that the whole money gets lost in these kinds of things? Are you the investor or is it someone else? Um, who, uh, what's the risk for the borrower? Uh, so for the entity that borrows um, the money, uh, what's their operational risk? Can you reduce that risk, for example, by providing a minimum number of users, providing supporting services to reduce this kind of risk. Then taxes is an issue. There I don't want to speak much about it because I also always use experts um, for these kinds of things, especially if you have these arm length companies and these kinds of things. And then, and this is most important, this is why I put it up, think about if you have to repay it, how you will repay that money. Um, I've worked with many development banks over the years and they provide money as loans in many countries. The KFW, the German one, um, does that a lot. And the municipal employees in the city always forget to think about, you know, if we invest this money now, how do you pay it back with interest? So don't forget about this whenever you take loans, that this is actually something, a loan you have to pay back. And that's um, uh, important. So I now just want to go for three, four minutes over some Examples, we don't have the time to go in detail because as today is mostly about examples, um, about some elements of what you can do uh, and what we might not have thought of when it comes to um, uh, financing mobility projects. So one is you can uh, issue bonds, uh, either green bonds or social impact um, bonds that are basically debts provided by um, uh, the city um, for the municipality um, to um, to go uh, to invest in mid and long term projects. Um, these kind of payments can be dependent on social uh, outcomes. So the whoever invests in them doesn't have to have a fixed return rate, but they could also have um, a return rate that's dependent on the um, outcomes. Then you can have something like usage fees. Um, if you, for example, improve the waste collection service or the public transport uh, service that you can increase the fee for those that are re receiving um, these kinds of um, uh, activities. And um, there is something as a municipality with providing, um, with providing assurances um, you can also provide low interest loans because as a municipality, you normally have a very good um, uh, risk uh, analysis, good risk rates with, with banks and giving assurance in the background often allows you to issue very low interest loans and grants to provide um, to, um, to citizens or other users of the city. These are just some examples and um, I don't want to go into that in detail at all, but just saying that the important part is that you can, in the end, um, combine these kinds of mechanisms. So once you get a hold of them and once you have used them once or twice, uh, you, you can really think about, okay, I take a ho whole project, put it into small pieces, and for this part, I'll give a guarantee. For this uh, part, I'll take a grant. For this part, I'll take debt myself. For this part, I'll do a, a joint um, uh, a joint venture with a private entity. So that's just from my side a very brief introduction again into what um, uh, financial engineering you can do with urban mobility projects. Just as a little bit of more specification, what we touched already last time. You will receive all the slides afterwards, so you can have a look into more detail into what we have shown. And in any case, I'm always happy to answer questions. And uh, now I will hand over to Miguel, who will show you some of the um, public funding available on the European level at the moment, and then really go into many of the examples we brought for you for urban mobility projects, our use cases in that part. Please, Miguel. Thank you, Alex. Um, 
So as con continuing what Alex was mentioning, just quickly overview of some of the European uh, funding that might be and should be interesting for you to look at. As we don't have much time, I just uh, will um, say them a bit out loud where you have right now with the new uh, European framework. There's a lot of funding coming up and not only for the European Union members, but also for associated countries, which you can find in, uh, further on the European Commission website and much of you uh, are included there. Namely, uh, you can be associated for, for funding on the Horizon Europe, um, on the international partnerships, which is the former Europe aid and uh, aims to, to provide funding for, um, for cities worldwide. Um, second, thirdly, you have the JPI Urban Europe, which is the, it's a funding that, that you can use for uh, research with your research institutions. Um, the, the next two, which is Urbact and Interreg, might be more interesting for the European uh, Union-based cities, which is a very um, common funding and you, most of the projects that I'm going to show afterwards and the use cases come indeed from Interreg funding. And last but not least, because there are many, many more, it's one that is mentioned, it was mentioned last session, which is the, in the European Investment Bank, you can find uh, a lot of interesting, not only loan mechanisms, but also uh, mechanisms for funding your solutions when it comes to greening your cities. And the many more, because there are indeed many more, but we will now pass to the exact use cases. So we're just gonna change a bit here, the, the screen sharing. If you allow me for a second, you should be able to see it now. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so as a start and a, and a, a primer, primer note would be right now, please, if you have any questions, if you have any remarks to add, please do not hesitate on raise your hand in the chat or, um, or write a message. The first example that was shared comes through a lot of you talking about the challenge of in increasing um, soft mobility. So we talked about soft mobility, which goes to active mobility and other modes that are not motorized. The first example comes exactly from, from Split in Croatia, where they started from scratch uh, a bike and e-bike sharing system. So this, the challenges that they were addressing are quite obvious, as we discussed also last time for a bike sharing system, is in the end to decarbonize your, uh, your transport. So reduce congestion of traffic, um, increase the, um, the efficiency of your traffic, uh, especially when you have um, volatility, meaning if you are a touristic city in summer, you will benefit a lot from this type of solution because you are not only in a, a, way, a place that the weather is favorable for active transport, but also a place where you have um, the saturation of your roads, of your current transport infrastructure for single use vehicles. The other uh, challenges addressed are, are mainly uh, corrected by um, air and noise pollution, which it's directly from, from a, a green mode of transportation and the geographical and spatial limitations within the city, therefore the landscape of the city. In this project, they basically started from scratch and integration within the city model from traditional and electric bikes. Um, in this project is a very good example of a partnership between the municipality and the company, although owned by the municipality, which you can see it's called the split parking. Uh, they shared the project, the municipality co-funded uh, with a project from Remedio, which is from Interreg uh, Med. Um, and 85% of this funding came from, from the Interreg Med and the remaining budget was uh, used by or from the city, which can see 6% uh, on the bottom left corner and 9% of national budget. So you can see that although the amount was, uh, was around 100 and 200,000 in total, they managed to find uh, funding from, to cover almost everything. 
Split Parking is a company owned, is a municipality owned, and is responsible for the implementation, making that that the city doesn't have to deal with the daily um, operations of the bike sharing system. And it is very important because makes it gives it an independent independent arm of the city and much more successful for the future uh, of this solution. One of the keys for success that we can talk about here is the externalization, as I mentioned, for, for the, uh, from the city and a joint procurement tool. Joint procurement is key when procuring innovation because you can find better ways of paying for your, um, for your solution. So including joint procurement between municipalities. So you and your uh, next municipality next door could align and procure more so imagine that you want to procure a bike infrastructure for your city, you will pay X, but if you procure a bike infrastructure for three or four cities, I can ensure you that you will pay less per city than you would do it on your own city. So this is a very good example that you should reconsider uh, for, for the future. Um, continuing with this example, just for you to have an idea on how actually this impacted uh, the city. So they started with a few bike stations and over the years, there has been such a growing interest that they implemented uh, 56 more, not only in the city of Split, but also in the surrounding cities, making this a large scale project and benefit a multi-city benefit project as well. You can see here, there's a map where you can see where the bicycles are and which bicycles are available and um, the stations. Stations, why? Because this is a, a, dock, a docking, uh, docking bicycle system. So the, the bikes are in docking as we uh, explained in the last session, a couple of examples. They are very similar and normally they have represent very high success. Some bottlenecks or problems encountered is that, well, public procurement is still uh, not very uh, easy to do, especially when we do these joint procurements to be open. This was in the, between the European Union. So there's the European Union regulations that they have to comply to. And there's expertise most of the times needed to do so. Um, then we talked about two types of bicycles. So it was the normal and traditional ones and the electric ones. And it was hard because the um, the, the grid and the, the charging infrastructure took more than more time than they actually wanted to. And this is crucial then for the charging of the bicycles. Important here to note that most of you talked about hills and in your city, um, you'd, it's, it's sometimes there, it's challenging with high temperatures that people use shared bicycles because the, because the, they will sweat, right? So you get very warm while using your bicycle and you don't want to go to work with the bicycle if you arrive there and you have a meeting uh, with, your, with your colleagues and you are completely wet. Therefore, the electric bicycles can solve this. There was an issue 10 years ago, five years ago that electric bicycles were very expensive. However, at this very moment, you can find electric bicycles in the market from value from $500 to around $5,000. So there is solution for you, especially if you join forces with more uh, municipalities for more demand, you get this value, you get closest to the lower value. And this is highly beneficial for you. Um, do you think at this very moment, this example, I think it's, it's very important to see how to start from zero and then try the first time, people liked it so much that they have to improve. And now they reached almost a hundred stations of bikes in their city. So it's, it's a successful long-term implementation. Um, do you think, and now I, I point back to you, do you think that this it would be feasible in your city with the values that were here shown before? So we are talking about between 100,000 and 200,000 euros uh, for implementing this type of solution in your city. I would invite you to, to talk and, and say that if this makes sense uh, and why or not, so why couldn't you, could not you implement such a solution and also why? So that we can um, understand better how to tackle your issues on, on this problem. If you want to, to talk, please uh, raise your hand or write in the chat or just feel free to to turn on your microphone if no one else uh, is speaking. 
I will give you um, five to 10 seconds. If no one um, wishes to make any question, I'll pass on to the next example. Uh, sorry, I can uh, speak? Yes. I'm uh, uh, engineer Leila from Greater Urban Municipality. Well, I, I think this is a great idea if we can uh, implement uh, this uh, idea in our uh, city and uh, the municipality uh, can uh, contribute to to this uh, some uh, some project like this uh, and encourage the use of a bicycle. Um, but there is a different uh, point related to this subject. Firstly, that the, the, the society ac can accept to start to use a bicycle because in our city, we don't see people using a bicycle. Uh, for this, for example, we have a star, our um, project uh, as traffic awareness and transportation committee at the municipality to change, uh, to try to change um, the narrative about the, or the behavior about the mobility and the between uh, uh, issue related to mobility is the use of bicycle in a city. And uh, the second point is, uh, uh, if we want to adapt this uh, project, this kind of project, the municipality, how we will finance this uh, financing this project, um, and how? Uh, um, because it is very important, the subject of financing a project of the at the level of the municipality, where the budget of the municipality cannot be. Um, it's not enough to, to use it for this kind of project. So uh, we have two elements. Firstly, we would like to use, I think it's important to adapt this kind of a project, but still how to, uh, to work to develop this idea at the level of society and uh, adapt it correctly at the level of the municipality. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you very much for your points. Um, I, I, will, I will start to reply first for, if, if I may, to the one that you, you talked about, the general awareness of uh, how actually citizens see the, the bike usage as a, as a positive thing and they actually tend to use it. Um, going a bit back, as Alexander was mentioning before, we can start with focus groups. So see with the people, why are they keen on using the bicycle and what could we do to make it better? Some examples, and I'm going to explain some a bit further, are to choose a target um, stakeholder that you can engage and easily integrate in your system. Normally, students are actually one of the most successful first piloted targets of these solutions, because if you give them some uh, benefits, meaning if you give them the usage of such service in the beginning for free, they'll start to do it and they will start to move some masses. And normally they are more keen in experimenting new solutions rather than other types of stakeholders in society. Uh, for the second point, and I, I truly agree with you when you say that financing is highly challenging, there are two sides uh, that we can understand this. The first one is, would be to, so as this case, this was financed by European Union project. So they, they got a lot of money to implement this pilot action and then to develop it further. After a couple of years, these type of projects are, are, are meant to be uh, to be um, financially stable so that they actually can pay for themselves. Um, of course, in the beginning, this won't happen. So this led, leads to the second point, which could be the, the type of loans that the, the World Bank or the European Bank can, can, can give to you. And then you can externalize, as they did here, the service to a company, even public owned, that would make the revenue of this. And after, let's say, five to 10 years, the service can start paying for itself. And it's indeed, let's say, a, a business for itself and not something that the city is just doing for the well-being. So let's say that creating a business model around it. I hope I uh, answered your questions, but I also happy to, to discuss it further. Um, yes, thank you, thank you. If anyone else has any points, uh, doesn't have any points, I would pass to the next example, which it's connected. However, it's an example on how to refurbish um, a bike sharing system that was not successfully implemented. So in the city of Yogmensitsa, I never can uh, pronounce this name properly, it is in Greece, um, at the city level, they had a very small bike sharing system that was misused. So it was, was something that was complex. So the user, it was not properly consulted when it, this was introduced. So they, they could not 
They did not understand that they were not taking usage of the system. Result, it ended up mistreated, parts were missing, bikes were uh, trashed, just was a complete failure. However, it is possible to turn this into a success. The infrastructure was there, although small. So what they did was they, they applied, this was again with the Interag Mediterranean um, funding, they, they installed a third, uh, three uh, stations. So increasing the stations, when I mean stations, it's the dockings where the bikes will stay. Um, and they increased the bikes from 10 to 30. You can see that this is a very, very small scale. However, it worked. So they improved the design, they made better communication, and they did user engagement. They talked with the people that used the bikes to understand why weren't they using it and what would make them use the bikes, which is crucial for something like this. Uh, and last but not least, something that was not predict predicted at the beginning is that the conditions of weather and being outside can also interfere with the quality of the bike. So they have to provide safe environment for the bikes to stay overnight and not to be damaged due to weather conditions, theft, or any other type of corrosion. For this case, there was an initial investment uh, of uh, to 330,000 euros with the, with the three bike stations, the 22 bikes, and then there was extra uh, funding just to make a, let's call it a, a report to understand if it, go, if it went well, if it did go wrong, and why, was the, why were the, the key factors for, for success. And this is also why this information is here, that well explained, and I will show you some nice facts afterwards. Um, the keys for success, as I mentioned, user engagement, um, get, get better accessibility to the people, make it more simple, that people can just plug and play, meaning that you can use it easily without having to, to fill uh, X amount of paper or that they have to, to, to subscribe to something that is so hard that then you just don't want to do it. Um, some key facts can come from the impact and results. So you can see here in the in July 2019 there was an average uh, rides per month of 25. If you can see my my um, my mouse, you see here the rides per month of July 2019 25. This number was very very low. You can see the average can come to about 30 40 per month for 2019. And then for 2020, with the integration of the service, you can see that the rides in increased and 1,000%. So from 84 to 1,001 rides per month just by multiplying. So the, the bikes were not 100 more bikes. There were only 20 more bikes uh, tripling the system. However, they managed to have 600 re registered users against 100 in the past. And now they have the system working and avoided CO2 emissions are also very, very high. You can see here uh, the number, uh, which it represents for 30 bicycles only. So imagine if you have a system with 1,000. Um, some bottlenecks encountered then at the end to, to understand this was not, not only roses and gold. Uh, it's also that they had to, to use external experts to help them, especially with the, with the users and the definition of the system. One of the key success at the end, however, hard to manage during the process. Uh, the, also, by managing this system to, to more cities that they wanted to do, there was also some uh, challenge due to the operations uh, and then to the in unavailability of data. Um, and as well, then later on, on the infrastructure side, uh, because of the, the damages of the previous bicycles that they have. I will pass then to one example to close the bike sharing system because there was a lot of hills, so I decided to include this example um, because as, as from my own country, uh, I would like to talk about it. Lisbon is known as the city of the seven hills. So 15 years ago, when people talked about sharing bicycles in Lisbon, everybody said, you're crazy. I'm not gonna use a bicycle if I have to climb three hills to get from home to work. However, today they have more than 1000 bicycles around Lisbon with more than 80 charging stations, a service that is done by this company here, which is ML, again, a state-owned company, city-owned company that deals with mobility and parking with the city. This is a multi-million dollar, a multi-million euro project. So it costed more than 20 million euros to put this to run over the last 10 years. However, 
I can ensure you that it works and it has electric bikes in it. So people can actually go up and down the hills and it's very, very used by the, uh, the citizens. At this very moment, I cannot prov provide you the key figures of the financial sustainability of it, but I, would I invite you to take in consideration that it is possible to do it, and especially with hilly cities, and a successful case also for tourists and for local citizens, with a normal price that people can will think that is cheaper to use a bicycle than actually to have a car. Um, if anyone now has questions about the bike sharing systems, I'll we will have um, a couple of minutes to, to talk about it. If not, we will move to the next step. But I, I, I will put in the air one question. If you take off financing, let's, let's take financing as a challenge that, that we would have all the money to implement however and whatever we want in our city. What would you do? Would you implement a bike sharing system with electric bikes or not and why? If you have, if you want to to move forward, please um, raise your hand or just unmute yourself um, at the at the Zoom function on the bottom. Yeah, uh, just uh, as a note, uh, I would like to say that well, as Med City is also well, uh, here in Barcelona, uh, there is the example of bike sharing of uh, we, we call it bicing. You mentioned it last last week. So, for example, if any of the municipalities would like to learn a bit more about that, uh, we can uh, try to make the contact and so that, for example, they can know how to start it or lessons learned or whatever. Thank you for, for sharing the note, Jim. I think this is, this is very important to know because they know for sure how it started from day zero, day minus one until actually things work. Same as here, uh, the, the country, the fellow country next to, to Spain where they did it. Um, also, we are happy to, to help in that sense if it's needed. Um, in case there are no further comments or questions uh, at this stage, uh, well, we have a comment in the chat from Mr. Gassan, so, sorry if it's uh, misspelled. If financing is solved, I'm sure that we need, that we and many other cities would go ahead, especially with hybrid traditionally bike systems. Uh, thank you for, for your input. And definitely that makes, makes us, us think that it's not only other challenge that financing is the very heart uh, of most of, of, of your challenges these days and we, that we agree as well as not only Mediterranean cities, but also other cities um, have the same. And we encourage you to use this, the mechanism that we mentioned before uh, to try to finance your solutions. So not going alone, go with someone else that can help you in the long term. I'm gonna move now uh, to the next slide, which is about that addresses the challenges of improving uh, public transport within your, your city. This is a, let's say, a half-hearted challenge, a half-hearted use case. From the one hand, it's a very nice and developed concept. From the other hand, it was not implemented at the end. And this is why I bring it here today. Um, the challenges addressed, it was in the city of Madrid in Spain. At the district level, there was a lot of congestion in a specific um, area. So what they decided to do was to create a bus corridor. So a, a corridor where buses would have uh, rapid transit and would be connected to, to other intermodal facilities so that people could use them and try to get for their last mile using a different type of transport, walking, cycling, or however you would prefer. This was a project with an investment, initial investment for almost half a million euros. However, financed from um, European from the eccentric project, the full project finance, the finance, the number that is mentioned here is not only for infrastructure. So it was for planning, monitoring, and all the other costs related to it. So when it comes to infrastructure, the, 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 um, the amount should be around 70% of this value. Um, the keys for success in the beginning, it's due to the planning, is that there, was a, there are a lot of studies of different urban corridors that were carried out during the, the recent years, and they had also a lot of plans to do so. So the study, the most relevant um, constraints were technical or economical, but solutions were, uh, were proposed, and uh, the final pro construction, decision for construction was almost informed. 
However, and passing now to the next slide, um, this would uh, increase the, the speed of the bus by 10% and the regularity of the service by 9%, reaching um, much better numbers than before. Um, and then model share would increase within, within the city, not only on this place itself by 4% and emissions could reduce by 30% on the district. However, the city did not decide to, in, at the end, the, the project was not implemented due um, to, to the, the municipality not being aligned uh, with, with, uh, with itself. So mentioning that when you, you should plan this, this type of project, you should not work in a silo mode. So because if you are working diff with not in, um, in cooperation with the other department from your municipality, um, this can, can hinder your process and may cause co uh, examples like this. And this is not what we want, right? Spending years in planning, having everything ready and get to the implementation phase with also <laughs> with the funding which lacks, as, I, as we could see from most of you, and then stop it. This is not um, a, a good practice on the accents, but it's a good practice on the planning. So it's, I'd say, an awareness use case for you to take into consideration the full life cycle of the process and do not figure it out on the road because it's very important to plan. Again, I invite everyone that has any questions, concerns, to, to raise the voice uh, or commented in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will happily move forward to our next case. So if there, uh, give it a couple of seconds, please also can write in the chat. Uh, there is one question. Uh, I've, I believe it was from last session, but I missed, I didn't see it. Um, again, from Gassan, Mr. Gassan. Uh, the question, I'll read it out loud. Do you have any, uh, do you have experience with financing where shop owners become co-investors? Um, maybe uh, I, I myself, I do not have this particular experience, but maybe Alex can, can, can say something on this respect. Um, you can hear us, Alex? Yep. Yeah. Um, so um, personal experience when it comes to shop owners being co-invested in, into um, bike sharing systems, no. We have had um, uh, projects where, um, you know, large employers, they, were, they didn't have shops, but they had manufacturing or um, um, service behind um, some of the stations. They co-invested heavily. And that basically then also put stations in front of their buildings. So that we have seen. Um, when it comes to shop owners, we have seen co-investment into infrastructure that was not bike sharing, but that was, you know, public information systems where they, um, these are like these, you know, you might call them information hubs. So they're basically public screens that also provide advertisement and location services and these kinds of things they would uh, they have co-invested in this so I'm just because I'm saying I haven't experienced it myself I'm not saying this is not a, a valuable idea and a valid uh, concept but I haven't so in the works that we have done um, this hasn't happened but it's definitely possible uh, I may add one, one point to that, which is not about the bike sharing itself, but example that uh, shop owners would co-finance some actions, uh, depending also on the framework of, of the country, but it happened, for example, also in Portugal, that shop owners could co-finance with the local municipalities e-charging station. So if you, you are looking to, to put uh, electric uh, uh, charging stations for electric vehicles in parking spots, some of the shop owners that have parking spots, they will be interested in some, most of the times can be interested in co-financing these electric uh, charging stations because it would benefit the city and they'll, themselves for the customers. Um, I hope this answers to, to your concerns. Um, great to know. So now we will uh, pass to the next slide, uh, which is an example again from Madrid, but it's more of an example of citizen engagement. Um, in this case, it was in another district level, there was um, some resistance. So some people that were uh, not that used, used 
to to work and to travel by public transportation, meaning you're talking about normally the vulnerable groups when you talk about children, teenagers, um, elderly people, and sometimes women that do not feel safe in such environment. Um, so the city of Madrid uh, made this wonderful bottom-up uh, participative initiative where they, so as Alex mentioned before in this case, uh, they brought these people together, put them into workshops, set them down, talked ideas, made actions or also informative actions. So they promote saying, okay, how is active mobility? How is tr public transport? How can this um, work? And very, very important. So they brought uh, people to act as campaign leaders. So in Alexander's example, you had someone volunteering to uh, have a Facebook group. And this is important. In this case, people were campaign leaders, so they could campaign about this, um, this type of solutions. Why? Because they feel owners of the system. So feeling ownership, it's, it's key for people to use the solutions that you bring them, uh, and then for further success of whatever implementation that, that you do. Um, this case was a rather expensive action because it took, um, took quite some time, but it was also funded by um, eccentric budget from, from the European Commission. It's, eccentric is the name of the project. Um, the project was basically uh, working with five schools and four elderly social clubs in the living lab of Vallecas. Um, and uh, there was an involvement of, of the city and, and some of other private companies. Uh, by involving the population, by involving the citizens, they made sure that people like to, to be involved, to like to be heard, and actually even more like to know that their uh, opinion is considered. Continuing uh, to, to, no, not this one. If I may add one more point on this, uh, is not that the solution was was groundbreaking, was not changing the lives of the people in, in Madrid, but it's a, a good solution. So if you face problems that people are not using your uh, this implementations being public transport, bike sharing, electric vehicles, logistics that you want to implement in your city to make deliveries, you have to find someone in the users that can vouch for you that can do it with no interest whatsoever. Because you, as um, a city, you have all the interest that the people use it, but the citizen, the user, as themselves, they, uh, they, they have no personal gain that people use it. So other citizens will trust them, will trust in their experience. Um, do you think that in your communities, people, citizens, or even other stakeholders as, as private businesses or, or uh, NGOs would be happy or would be willing to support you uh, towards your actions of implementation of solutions, even though that they have no, um, let's say financial gain out of it for social reasons. I invite you now again to, to, to raise your voice and, and we'd be quite um, happy to hear this experience. And also if you, if you have done this in the past, was it successful? or not and why I'll give some 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 seconds you can also write in the chat if you think that that you don't want to speak it out loud um, or what is even preventing you for doing such actions uh, in your cities have you brought people together right now we are in the the pandemic things took a different shape in most of the country. So these actions of bringing people to, uh, that you could invite someone to a nice uh, workshop of day where you offer some lunch and some nice good time, uh, this cannot happen. So things move to online. People resist sometimes a bit more, but I believe that that literacy and especially web literacy for, for joining this type of online sessions are, is also increasing a lot at the moment. So if, if there is no one uh, that we wishes to move forward, we can we can pass this to the next slide um, and leave the, the citizen engagement part. Example highlighting from, from Alexander, um, there was a question of, of where was this example uh, from? Um, I don't know if this was back in the, in the, in the chat, but I, I, we can now talk and don't know if Alexander wants to, to mention uh, where was the example and which stakeholders were involved. From, from the citizen engagement that we mentioned before in the first part. Alex. 
Are you muting yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm here. I'm just um, the. You mean the large example of the overall um, project that I um, um, put um, up with the multi with the multiple steps? Correct. Correct. Yeah. No, that's the um, that one is from the Netherlands, from a South Dutch municipality called Helmond, ninety thousand inhabitants. Or rather, you know, in, um, let's say in comparison to many other um, cities there um, uh, with a under average um, productivity and um, uh, social standard um, without wanting to put that much further. So it's a, it's a Southern Dutch uh, city. Thank you very much, Alex, for, for example, that. And you have some problems with your voice, so I'll mute you. Um, I will continue to the next example from that must be known uh, here for, for Gemma and, and also from Laia from, from Barcelona, uh, which is quite simple. But you mentioned some of you uh, in the in the beginning also Gassen that were there were some taxi services that you also trying to to increase efficiency. So um, in Barcelona the the taxis it's it's as you know it's a very highly touristic city so there's a lot of taxis going around back and forth. Uh, grabbing people and then that was made a very simple example of how to monitor the taxi stands um, so that you know and you have information for taxi drivers and users of how many taxis are there and uh, and how many are, are available. So this is a very simple action to you know the to change the old method or calling to a number of taxi radio or taxi provider and asking who is available or not is moving this to the next step of the platform um, of the IoT. It all looks very fancy, but in the end it comes down to three simple points. One, a sensor on the ground that can detect if it has a taxi or not. The second one, um, low power wide area, which is a very small and easy to implement wireless technology. And then in the end, a data platform that can gather this information in the cloud. This, um, it's not very expensive to implement. I don't have the key figures for this particular example. However, I can ensure you that this is not something that would pass the, 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 a lot of the thousands of euros. It's more than important to see the monitoring that you can actually have the, the infrastructure and the people within or your municipality or your uh, city or another company that is uh, working with you that can provide uh, this service. So the keys for success here are what the keys for success here are that um, that the taxis operators were were informed about the measure, so they were happy about it, so they could um, use it. And there was a, a driver survey, so they asked the driver and they liked the measure because in the end it's about increasing efficiency, which increases not only users of the the, the taxis but also revenues for the taxis themselves. So. If you go here for the impacts and results, so there was a, a reduction. So especially cars going around back and forth looking for customers. Um, and then in the end, this gives a lot of uh, sub uh, impacts, which are you know reduction of traffic congestion, reduction of uh, taxi drivers that are uninformed, um, the provision of information, uh, giving new potential clients, um, a new strategy to increase customers, and also you know the the good. Um, the new thing that normally people also like, uh, the curiosity of using a new tool, a new uh, possible way of improvement, and you feel more smart, smarter in your mobility system. Um, so then some, some bottlenecks and problems encountered in this can be that where you place the sensors, so how actually you do the technical aspect, uh, how do you place the sensors, uh, how do you make the data communication so the 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 the, the type of, of that i mentioned before which is the ilpwa you can find it here um low power wide area technology proved to be not that efficient as uh, as it should be but it's it's all about good planning um and and one one can see here that behavior and technology can change rapidly this is true so 
rules might be necessary. And another point that it's not highlighted here that some other cities mention is that if you have this system and if you externalize it to an external company, you have to ensure that this company or is within your control or that you have something legally bounded that will support you and the company to work in the long term. Because if you buy some this service for an external stakeholder for a contract of five to 10 years, and then this, this um, service, this contractor decides to discontinue the service, you'll have empty hands. We have no data, you have no service, and you will have a lot of years that you, you invested in something that will not be for the long term. So always bet on the in-house, uh, although with cooperation, but in-house ownership of of the, the um, cooperation. Um, I will not further develop on this one because this is an uh, easier example when it comes to passing old services to more um, to new and uh, more um, smarter mobility ones. I'll then go to the next one, which is um, about tracking information system. So how to track data with your, within your mobility system. Here, we have an example from Copper uh, in Slovenia where they wanted to understand where are uh, their buses, where are their cars, uh, where are the, the parking spots. So they implemented, um, let, it's, in the end, it's a traffic information system that will uh, support the city managers then to, to know what is happening in the city. So have good data to make proper planning for the future. So if you want to make your uh, sustainable uh, urban mobility plan you and you have you know where buses are having congestion where is the saturation where you don't have parking where more accidents happen this is crucial and very important for you to know so for their, their challenges they they knew about you know they they had air and noise pollution they have a lot of congestions and they have a lack of uh, of information when it comes to public transport so by installing gps's on bus um, installing um, so the other end of showing information to the people at bus stops, uh, creating smart parking, so putting sensors on on parking for people to know also uh, where they can park and for the city to know where the parkings are being filled or not, where you have to increase parking or decrease parking. Uh, the development of mobile applications. So if we should have an app uh, to, to tell you all of this information, or even if you just want to sell the data to, to another provider that can do this for you, um, data is very important in both ends. Some cities also decide to cooperate with, with technologies such as Waze or, or, or Google itself to, to de develop such systems. Uh, and last but not least, having a, a, a traffic information center. So a place exactly we can coordinate all of this. It can be yours, it can be externalized, but it's crucial for that you can control all this information and all the, the operations in a daily basis. Um, this is a very good example when it comes to costing. So it's, estimate, it's estimated that uh, the costing was uh, around a quarter of a million euros, so 250,000. And this provided the ability for the city to to know and, and and to integrate all of this this data with the citizens, with the users, and possibly if you if you want to integrate new mobility uh, solutions um, to give this to to the possible future uh, innovators. Um, do you do you think that in your cities, how if you don't have this system yet, um, if how far? would you be from, from, let's say, from planning some, something like this until implementation? Do you think that in the next five years to 10 years, if you don't have it, would be something that you would like to do, or this it would be something very futuristic for, for yourself? Sorry, I can't speak. Uh, I'm Leila. Yes. Yes, Leila, please. So, um, um, well, uh, I consider that data, it's very important to take the best decision concerning the city. And um, uh, concerning our municipality, we have uh, we develop this issue through G uh, geographic information system GIS. M maybe it's not in the same way as uh, the uh, the example of Slovenia, but we use the um, uh, GIS uh, to develop our uh, geodatabase uh, and uh, to. Uh, 
uh, to uh, create our uh, layers, our uh, uh, information concerning uh, uh, the network of mobility. And we are developing this and now we are working in this. Uh, and uh, sure, we want to see uh, how we can develop this issue more better, you know, and how we can, uh, this can contribute to develop uh, uh, in a good way the decision uh, take by the municipality concerning the urban mobility and transportation. So uh, uh, what I want to say that uh, we are in phase to build, uh, we have different data. Uh, concerning uh, mobility, uh, which are integrated in uh, GIS, and we are looking now to develop it more, better, um, uh, and to develop uh, more the model of urban mobility based in GIS to uh, manage in a good way our mobility system. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's uh, very good that, that you mentioned that. May I ask you, when did you start to implement this? Will you mention now? Is it was a couple of years ago? <laughs> We, uh, we have started this uh, to build our uh, layers because um, when we have started to adopt the GIS, so we have not all the layer. Mm -hmm. So we're concerning the mobility and transportation, maybe uh, two years two years ago we have started this, and um, we still we are working because we need to build the in correct way our network in GIS. Uh, in a correct way, which means that to have the good data, uh, to have um, <clears throat> uh, the good information, which not easy sometimes, which need the field work survey, and but we are working in this, and we hope we can develop it uh, um, during this year, and to adapt it sure each year. Thank you. Thank you. That that's that's great to know, and and definitely uh, GIS. Um system for your city it it helps a lot a lot with the planning and and if you can develop all the layers that that you need in the end you have one of the best um ways that you can take informed and and data driven decisions for your for your municipality so uh, thank you that for that Ms. Leila. Leila and it's great to to know that you are working on it I will will also um share here the comment from 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 Elton from Dures um, which, which mentioned that a mobility observator will be a useful actor on the future development. And he personally thinks that that would like to see an operative in, in three years. So I, I wish you um, the best of luck to push for that. Because as, as I, I speak for me and Alex, when we, when we say that this is key, is a key aspect for, for having one of the best plannings for mobility in your, in your cities as data can, can be the, the starter for a lot of new ideas and new implementations. Uh, with that said, um, I appreciate your contributions and I will then move to the next um, case, which is a bit more generic and it comes from the national level of um, uh, Egypt's bike sharing. So th this comes a bit from, remember when I told you uh, some, some minutes back that you should look for stakeholders that can be your pilots in, in this implementation. Um, so this is exactly what happened here at a certain stage. It's not all of it because this project itself, it's not a specific project, it's the experience that Egypt has with the global environmental facilities, small grants program from the United Nations, so from the development program, the UNDP, that has been supporting Egypt throughout the last I'd say, I think 30 to 40 years since 1988, if I'm not mistaken, to, to with, with mobility. However, at this moment, they, they managed to have already 38 projects in this field and have distributed 15,000 bicycles throughout governments and throughout the resolving fund mechanism. So they they actually use this is one of the funding mechanisms that you can try to use to pass your, your challenges at the moment when it comes to funding these sort of solutions. Um, and last but not least, you can see here in the picture uh, the students from um, from from one of the from university because they pioneered this co one of the corporations in in 2015 um, to to 17 with with cities with cities with students in universities 
so that they were encouraged to use these bike, this bikes. Students are always, again, a good um, user target for, for piloting such actions because you cooperate with universities, the universities help you even to get sometimes with the technical aspects of such, um, such implementation as they have the know-how and the, the knowledge to, of the technical side. And then the students will be willing to promote the actions and happily use it uh, for the future. I will then pass to one example then, uh, also a bit different if it comes from, I know there's a lot of Tunisian cities um, in, in the call, I believe. Um, and it's an example when come, when come private, the private sectors comes by itself to, to, to change the, the mobility system. So we have here from, from Tunisia, the, the startup Intigo that, that started late in 2019. And up to this very moment, they, they have already $1.6 million of investment from private investors, from angel investors to ser Series A. Um, they can say that this service, so they, they have three types of services, which is transportation of people in the, in the motorbikes. So they have a motorbike where you can sit on the back um, and you, you kind of, it's, it's kind of different than, than some of the other services but you, it's a motorbike where you have the driver and you can sit on the back and the driver will take you wherever you want. They also make transportation of, uh, of goods. So they also work on the logistics and have a fun, let's uh, I'll call it a fun service, which is the concierge service where they can work and do, uh, do let's say, um, errands for you. Uh, however, this, this system, it's, it's considered rather uh, low in price, so they managed to get the eyes and the targets of people by managing to to be cheaper than regular taxis, to get your things fast and quick via an app. App of this that I speak that in the first month on in, on 2020, so before they get the investment, they got 30,000 downloads uh, and they had a fleet of, of 50 50 scooters and uh, one and one 11 11,000 drives rides just in January 2020 alone. So we're talking about in the very early stages. Now they've launched and they have much more. Um, other services like this can be found in, in the other countries. For example, here in Europe, we have a lot of, you know, the, the typical um, logistics ones. They even have now one service called Gorillas that what they, they deliver uh, goods for you and logistics in less than 10 minutes, 10 minutes that you can ask for it. Very similar to this service, only on logistics. You have, you know, the others, if you go for the, the taxi part, when it comes uh, to new models, you know, everybody knows about Lyft, Uber, um, Bolt, uh, when it comes only to transportation of people. So this type of transportation can and will try to operate in your city the goods and, and, and the important part is to know how actually will you work with them. So make it make it that they have to talk to you when they implement the solutions and be, be sure that you are part uh, on the discussions and your uh, plans are included when you bring a company like this to your cities. Because as you may see on another example, a lot of these uh, scooter companies just come and drop um, scooters and to, to the cities that sometimes ended up in, in rivers, in the water, break, broken everywhere. It's kind of, then it looks trash in the city. So one of the lessons learned from, from the major cities in Europe is that you have to talk with them, you have to sit down with them and make sure that they act to your regulations and you don't allow them to act alone in, the, in your city, but they act with you. Same uh, goes for this example. And now, as we approach uh, the end, I will pass back the word to Alex, who has two more examples um, to explain. One from a non-Mediterranean city, which is very important one to understand smart cities, and another one about how to have proper planning. So I will revert back the word to you, Alex. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Um, so the next example um, that, that we have here is actually um, from the same area I used the other example from non-Mediterranean, but we chose it because um, several of you also mentioned last time tourism is an important one. This has a lovely um, uh, tourism angle to it. So first of all, it's a very similar kind of concept than one of the um, examples uh, Miguel has already shown to you. Um, it uh, collects live traffic data um, from um, from the surrounding of that uh, particular district. Um, it has several um, uh, different versions on how to do this, but one that is rather new and one that we have not talked about is it uses cameras uh, with number plate recognition. Um, so it basically can read 
who is actually coming into the district. That might be interesting for some of you when it comes to accessing government parking facilities. That might be interesting for you when it comes to restricted areas in general. Um, uh, in that particular case, it's used actually as an additional service, so it's not a re re reduced mobility area. It's actually providing guidance for the um, user towards uh, going to the right um, location. So you can pre basically pre-book a parking space, and then the system there shows you where you need to go. So that it has the uh, on-street parking and the off-street parking, so parking garage included in it. The parking garages are from several different providers, so it was nicely technically integrated. And then the guidance systems, which are LED screens and some other um, uh, provisions, guide you actually to the parking spot. And um, this, um, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about with, uh, with that one in particular, is uh, it provides a live guidance system. So in this case, the trigger is actually who comes into um, the, uh, the area. With some of you where you might um, uh, have tourism um, uh, or tourists to steer around, you could uh, use other um, steering uh, mechanisms. For example, you could give them um, in like this very simple kind of LED screens on road. Um, you could provide the um, people with the in the morning with the guidance. Okay, here here is uh, where the morning event, um, or here is where it goes to the beach. And in the evening, you could um, use the same sign to show. Hey, this is where it goes um, uh, to this event or uh, to this uh, institution, to this museum. So you can actually change the guidance throughout the day, depending on what's happening in your touristic areas. Or you could actually really uh, think about, and that's something we have done in a city too, it's not yet implemented, but uh, where um, if a specific area runs too crowded, um, you could divert people away. So for example, if there are two routes to one of your major highlights uh, within, your, uh, within your city, then you can say, okay, this is the slightly shorter route, as long as this is not too crowded, please everyone go right here. But now it's too crowded, it's also unsafe now with the pandemic. Please turn to the left here, use the slightly uh, longer route, um, but stay safe uh, here in public spaces. So this live kind of guidance system, might it be for parking, might it be for guiding uh, tourists, it's just something that we wanted to, to share with you. It's not um, super complicated um, uh, to install. It's, it just needs, needs the data or you can run it on a schedule. And the other thing it needs, it's just um, uh, LED uh, screen, which is basically uh, like the ones you have on highways, just in much smaller, um, where it um, states drive slower or congestion ahead. Instead of these, um, large scale um, ones, you use them in smaller scale for, um, for within the city center. So that's just something we wanted to share with you because we thought this is an interesting element also for the tourist, touristic areas within uh, your cities or where you want to divert traffic differently um, depending on the time of the day. So just um, uh, as Miguel did it the same way, for some of you, maybe someone wants to comment on this. Is this a solution? This, you know, live updated guiding or the scheduled guiding with LED screen, something that um, some of you would consider that is interesting for some of you to implement. I, I was hoping here in particular, specifically with the um, touristic areas, but um, I'll move then uh, forward um, to our last um, example, actually, uh, which is from the Italian city of Potenza. So it's um, uh, south of Italy. Um, and um, this is actually a non-technical one, and we love that one a lot. And this is, I would say, an example um, that can be used in many of your municipalities um, as well. So this is about a mobility center. Um, which is basically um, like you want to say a tourism center where people go to find out about the touristic places. This is one where people would find out 
about the mobility in the um, uh, in in the region. So what um, it was there for? So it was co-financed by public funds. It was basically there to address the high uh, usage of. Um, to address the high um, usage of uh, private vehicles, um, to reduce emissions, and to basically guide people um, towards changing their behavior with regards to mobility. It's an information place uh, uh, for uh, the local mobility. It had some focus areas, some uh, connected initiatives, such as commuting initiative, where it was about specifically changing um, the, um, the behavior, where you, how you go to work, and how you commute in that sense but in general it was it is was not it is a space um, where anyone can walk in receive information on um, how to um, improve travel behavior on what options are available so it's a go-to point a central go-to point for these kinds of information and also um, there are um, mobility uh, employees of the municipality and of the arm length company that basically also work there, provide input and also get input from the um, uh, from the people that walk in there. And that was only the starting point of this initiative. Then there was um, um, in the initially four and then a fifth um, location, so something like co-location centers for these mobility, mobility offices being put around the city. Some were put into major employees, some were put in, uh, in just public offices that basically somehow served the same purpose, but um, provided additional go-to points for the local uh, people to actually go. And that brought basically the mobility planning and also you know, the informing of people just closer to the cities and the citizens and the travelers within the cities. In, in the development of this, a lots of different kinds of stakeholders um, were involved, so very much like we have shown you um, earlier already. And uh, the impact um, was um, very uh, positive. So these centers not just, um, so they became permanent um, uh, really and became a successful go-to point for, uh, for citizens to really understand and get to know about uh, public uh, trans transportation and it really provided this direct connection, this real um, you know, exchange between the users and the planners. So that's um, uh, what this one um, uh, was about. Um, it was part of a major redevelopment and understanding of the, uh, of the um, city and, um, uh, and part of the implementation of a mobility plan. And like this, um, uh, the you know, in, in during the project, uh, it, it got a lot more traction. So more users, more politicians, more uh, companies really wanted to join the program, wanted to use the activities. And this is why it's from my side considered a very simple but very useful measure that's not technical at all. It's just an organizational activity to bring planning really closer to the users, to the citizens, and. Um, have them really understand, provide input and use the urban mobility services that we have. So that's our last example. I'm opening up again if anyone uh, thinks about implementing something uh, like this, if this is something that you uh, are considering or if you think actually that this is something that you should implement or have already implemented in your, uh, in your municipality. then we we reach the end of of today's session especially for the long time speaking about and, and discussing the use cases but we still have of course time for um, any questions comments or or any other um things that you may want to say uh to to us in the session today Uh, so can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this presentation and the last presentation. It's very interesting to see. Um... 
Lila, now you muted yourself or you were muted. So now we cannot, we heard the first no. sentence. So it's always great to hear the thank you, but we would also like to, to yeah, hear your question. Yeah, sorry, yeah please. Sorry. Okay. So um, my question, my first question is how, um, because uh, the municipality, we have uh, established private company owned by the municipality, which will deal with the different uh, issue related to the city as waste management as and uh, also uh, the subject of uh, public uh, transportation the new law allowed the municipality to be in charge of uh, of the management of uh, public transport uh, more specifically uh, it's a project um, <clears throat> uh, developed between the ministry of transport and the municipality and uh, where we will have uh, 55 bus um, developed in a way we will have uh, correct frequency, a good bus station, etc., for a seven line in a city. Okay, so today the municipality cannot uh, manage this alone. So uh, we are looking at uh, elaborate the partnership between the private sector and the municipality uh, uh, through this uh, private company owned by municipality. But still, this is a new element for the city. How uh, this, if you have an idea, have been developed in other country, how the private sector have been involved uh, in uh, public transportation. And to say the in Jordan in general, the public transport transportation, it's okay public, but it's in general on owned by private sector, you know, not by the government. So how we ha can have a good uh, partnership. Okay, so there is many different ways on how to do it, and it's super hard to, to answer that in uh, uh, with, with that. I'll, I'll say some examples um, and then I hope we can bring this further then also in the next sessions and go hopefully in the uh, where we have the personal time uh, uh, in uh, hopefully then with with you as well to um, to manage that um, more closely so um, one way of doing it uh, if the expertise is not there um, but also if you're not sure how to um, engage or work with the public sector so are there there are actually some um, agencies or some of these utility companies, so these arm length, com arm length companies owned by the municipality from other municipalities uh, all across the Mediterranean that are doing it already, that have built the expertise for themselves and, um, and are operating or helping also other municipalities in doing this. A fun fact that you guys might not be aware of, the, um, the public transport operator of the city of Milan um, is operating the underground and the public transport in Copenhagen. We always think that Copenhagen is the very advanced one, but it's actually all operated by the Milan agency. And like this, you can um, um, uh, ask other um, companies or arm length companies from cities that you have already connections with to help you. So that's the one thing kind of tackling um, the um, the issue around not having the capacity in house at the moment because some uh, capacity is important um, for you to speak to the companies in, in eyesight because if you if you take someone that um, recognizes that you don't have you can actually discuss with them they it, it will start to become a a relationship where you know you're not working together but you are starting to pay them and uh, you more or less work for them uh, then in the end. So when it comes then to working with private sector, there are many different kinds of um, public-private partnership kind of models. So either you as a municipality set all the criteria um, and the public transport operator gets a fixed fee um, uh, for, for that. And you are basically in charge of setting the quality criteria. And um, we are a big fan uh, there um, of a mechanism where it's, uh, based on results, so payments are based on results, where um, where the public you give, let's say, not transport, you give some KPIs that are like user satisfaction, um, where you the operator is obliged to you do user satisfaction services, and parts of the payment is uh, dependent on these uh, user satisfactions, or you can um, have other KPIs on these kinds of things. So you you use the kind of intentions you have as a as a public entity and um, tell uh, the private sector, you know, we cannot 
we are not telling you how to implement it, uh, but we are telling you what we want out of this. And based on this, you'll get your payment. So based on what I heard now, that might be um, options. And when it then comes to the contractual issues, um, that's a thing that you know we cannot answer in a, in, in a minute here. Um, but there is many different options. I hope that helped already. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. As uh, you say, we we have started to contact uh, different um, uh, municipality, uh, Turkish municipality also, uh, Istanbul to um, to to see to them them experience about these subjects because it's very important. Yeah, thank you. If you want to, Lila, so the the um, transport planning department of uh, Istanbul. So we have given them training and advice. So we have good contacts there. If you if you they haven't gotten back to you yet, um, just uh, tell us and we'll get you in touch. So they are good friends. They are cool guys. Yes, thank you, thank you. If there are more questions, please, uh, everyone. That's what we are here for. We we happily. Uh, Reply to them else, we will um, also uh, hand back to Gemma for the last word. I, I will be before uh, before Gemma, maybe, I don't know if she's going to speak about this, but uh, just a word for the last session. If you're not going to mention it, Gemma, or if you will, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, I was going to mention it, but okay. if you want to say some, something, I will add to what you mentioned. Okay, okay, thank you. I'll just want to, to as, as a word at the last session will be highly interactive. So we will divide, we will a, a present a case of a, of a Mediterranean city, where you're gonna present the city, how it looks like, what challenges is facing and what metrics. So how is the city working on mobility? What are the strong points, the pain points and how the city should look like in terms of it's more data than, than really how it looks like in real life, but how it looks like, how is the mobility system working? And then we'll invite you to discuss on pain points, actions, um, and challenges that you will find on this uh, to solve and improve the mobility system of such city, which this part will be highly interactive and we will need you to, to cooperate and to discuss in order to, to get to the, to the latest results. Everything will be carried out by us or the rest. We just need to use your brain power for, for some minutes and your interests to contribute with the best ideas and, and, your, um, and well, your experience, of course, within your city. Yeah, well, just to add up to this, uh, I would like to mention that, and uh, as you said, next week there there will be different like subsec subsections. Uh, this will be or English or or uh, or French, sorry. So there will not be simultaneous translation in Arabic for next week. Uh, so well, we would just like to encourage uh, you to participate there. Also, at the end of next week, uh, I will explain you about the next um, section, which will be the mentoring process, and will you can receive one-to-one uh, -one advice from from Bable. Mm. So yeah, I will tell you all about it next week, but I will encourage you also to apply for that. For example, if now you had some ideas uh, about in possible things to implement on your municipality, or you would like to receive guidelines or of of where you could go, uh, next steps, etc. Mm, then I would encourage you to to apply for the mentoring process. So thank you all. Uh, I will not uh, delay more. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Miguel and Alex, uh, for the very nice slides. And thank you all of you who participated, and especially the ones who raised uh, questions and commented on their own case and so on. Uh, so see you all next week. Mm, I will send you the, the reminder with the new link and hopefully we will have a strong discussion, well, <laughs> a nice discussion about uh, this uh, case scenario. Thanks everyone. It was a pleasure this session again and looking forward to seeing you again next week. Likewise. Thanks, Gemma for everyone. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. everyone for joining. Gemma too.